The Vindication of the Martyrs, Revelation 15, 1 through 8. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and wondrous seven angels with the seven final plagues final, because with them the wrath of God shall have been brought to a full end. And I saw something like a sea of glass, but this time it was mixed with fire, and those who were in the process of winning the victory over the beast and his image and over the number of his name were standing on the sea of glass holding lyres of the Lord God. And they were singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, even the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and wondrous are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the ages. Who shall not fear you, Lord, and give glory to your name? For you alone are holy. For all the nations will come and worship before you. For these judgments shall have been made manifest before you. And after this I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels with the seven plagues came out of the temple, dressed in linen, shiny and clean, and with golden belts tied around their waists. And one of the four living creatures, that is a cherub, gave the seven angels seven golden bowls filled up with the wrath of God who lives for ever and ever. Amen. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter into the temple again until the seven plagues of the seven angels had been completed. Revelation 15, 1 through 8. Here we have a real-time depiction of the suffering of believers in the crucible of the great tribulation and the divine response in the preparation of the final seven plagues of wrath, judgment, and vindication of the believers. These last seven plagues do, as verse 1 declares, complete the wrath of God, since the seventh plague is synonymous with the series of judgments that precede and include Armageddon and the second advent, wherein Satan, Antichrist, the false prophet, and all those who have aided and abetted them in their evil deeds are removed from the earth, John's description of these events as a vision of a great and wondrous sign shows that, as was the case in the last two passages, what we are dealing with here is allegorical in part. John saw a similar sign, that is, of the dragon, at Revelation 12, 1 through 3, but that sign was great in the sense of being terrible, for it portended and portrayed the beginning of the great persecution, while this sign is not only truly great, but also wondrous for it portends and portrays God's mighty deliverance of those being persecuted. The seven angels who administer these final plagues of wrath, judgment, and vindication are the archangels, the same seven angels who were depicted in the previous two allegories of the harvest of believers and the vintage of the wicked, that is, they are described here as the seven angels, Revelation 15.7. Their rank is indicated in part by the similarity of their dress to that of the Messiah, Likewise girt with a golden sash, compare Revelation 1.13. Additionally, they receive their orders directly from one of the cherubim, the highest ranking of the angelic orders. The charge with which they are here entrusted is so dramatic that after they have received their commissions, we see the heavenly tabernacle, God's temple in heaven, filled with smoke, a sign that God himself has now taken over active and decisive control of events, and that nothing will now stay his purpose until his saints are vindicated and rescued and judgment paid out to his enemies. No one will be able to enter into his presence until these final plagues are carried out. The Song of Moses The Song of Moses is a song of deliverance, Exodus 15, 1 through 18, of salvation and vindication from the hands of unbelieving persecutors from Pharaoh, a type of Antichrist as we have seen, and the Egyptians in the historical analogy, and from Antichrist and those with his mark in our context. Moses' song celebrated God and his delivering of the children of Israel, both from the point of view of his glorious power and goodness in doing so, and also from the point of view of their miraculous deliverance and appreciation for it. Such is the case in the passage given. There is a critical difference, however, which is often misunderstood because of a misreading and mistranslation of the text. As pointed out previously, key passages dealing with the great persecution, this is a portrayal of believers who are still alive on earth and suffering in the crucible of the great persecution, for the glassy sea is heaven's looking glass into events transpiring on the earth. Therefore the depiction of these believers as standing on the sea, 
tells us clearly that they are still on the earth at this point. The fire represents the fiery trial of persecution they are currently enduring and demonstrates their need of immediate deliverance. So here we see these heroic believers enduring, persevering, and anticipating the deliverance to come while yet in the midst of the crucible. Moses and the Israelites praised God for deliverance through the sea. These believers are still in the midst of the fiery sea, compare Daniel's three friends fellowshipping with the Lord, while yet in the fiery furnace, Daniel 3.25, and praise Him for what He is about to do for them, humbling the nations and delivering them from the grasp of Antichrist. For them, this is just as certain as if it had indeed already happened. Here is true proof of faith and faithfulness, when with the eyes of faith we can look beyond the sorrows, the terrors, and the hardships of the here and now into the glorious future, though veiled from our earthly eyes, and glory in our Lord's sure deliverance even before the fact. These all died while still walking in faith, though they had not received the fulfillment of their promises. But while they lived, they did catch sight of these promises from a distance and saluted them, so to speak, thus making it plain to all the world that they were in effect strangers and sojourners on the earth. For people who express their faith in this way, make it quite evident that they are eagerly in search of a homeland other than the world they now pass through. Indeed, if these believers' hearts had yearned for the land from which they had departed, they would have had ample opportunity to turn back. But they were zealous for a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. He has in fact prepared a city for them. Hebrews 11, 13 through 16 That city is the new Jerusalem, and these tribulational believers, singing God's praises in the midst of the most intense persecution in history, surely belong to the number of those of whom our God is not ashamed. May we be worthy of that number, and prepared to behave with equal courage in the difficult and trying days ahead. And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, and on the earth there will be great distress among the nations, who will be greatly bewildered by the roaring of the sea and its massive waves, and men will lose heart out of fear and expectation of what is about to come upon the inhabited world. For the luminaries of the heavens will be powerfully shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and much glory. When these things begin to happen, stand up and raise up your heads because your redemption is near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all its leaves. When they have already come out like this, you can see for yourselves by examining it that summer is near. So also when you see that all things have come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is near. Luke 21.25-31 